Today, my presentation is going to focus on some biocompatibility strategies that we uh, incorporate with our clients to help them get through very tough regulatory uh, situations. Um, so a lot of this may be high detailed. I didn't want to go into some of the testing specifics, uh, but if you have questions, I'd encourage you to please uh, approach me later today and I'd be happy to answer any specifics that I don't cover in my presentation. So it's important to understand the standards that we're going to reference when we talk about biocompatibility. ISO 10993 is a suite of standards. So there are over um, 30 sections, you know, depending on what we reference uh, for testing and requirements. Uh, the main, main focus is usually between 1 and 18, are our main testing uh, standard focus right now. Um, we also reference the USA FDA guidance. So this is a guidance document that the FDA wrote so we could understand how they interpret 10993 part one. It's very, very useful uh, when you're approaching biocompatibility because you understand some of the thought process behind the requirements even in 10993. Um, so this document is available for free online. So if you've not referenced this within your facility or, or looked at it, I recommend that you search this online and read this document. Uh, I recommend it to our sales team even this week. I said, you should read this and, and know this. Uh, it helps you talk about biocompatibility. And I think for manufacturers, it helps you understand where you need to be compliant and to understand all of the standards is really well summarized in the, the guidance document. Uh, and of course in 10993 part one, where you'll also find a nice overview of biocompatibility. And of course, we will talk about MDR. Uh, you know, I read this, or I tried to read it, but it's over 300 pages, so it's very long. I tried to find the important parts. Uh, so of course, that's a great concern in the industry right now, the changes, and so we'll cover some of that today as well. So it's important when we talk about what's changing that we understand where we were before with biocompatibility. So this chart is um, one that I could put online up here because it's free from the FDA. This is their old chart. Uh, so it looks like, you know, checkbox approach, you know, you just go through, this is how we used to use it. We'd go through and we'd identify our device, say how it contacts the body, and then what tests do we need to do? Oh, we did this one and this one and this one. We send our reports and everything was okay. Um, so that's how it used to be. But now the problem with that that we're understanding as a as an industry is that w when we do this, we don't understand the materials we're using. Uh, it doesn't hold the companies and manufacturers responsible for understanding that. And we don't know why we're doing the tests. We're just doing them because it says we're supposed to do them. And so there was a gap between, are we really assessing the risk of the device? Uh, do we really, are we tracking how we're making our device and keeping that record consistent? And so because that was seen in the industry, the checkbox approach is no longer acceptable. So the title of ISO 10993 part one specifically has risk in the title. It says biological evaluation of medical devices, evaluation and testing within a risk management process. So this title was changed in 10993 part one in 2009. So we've had it for a while. Um, so it's not really a new thought, but the regulatory agencies and notified bodies are now um, regulating to that level. So with that expectation, and as we know, regulation drives behavior. So whatever they're asking of the clients and of the industry, that's what we're going to adhere to. So the agencies are now following the intent of 10993 part one um, better. And so we're also using that more as an industry. This is a good thing for industry. It is a good thing for medical device manufacturers because it opens the door to have more of a logical discussion with your regulatory agencies where you can talk about the science more instead of just, did you do the tests even though they don't apply? Did you do them? Did you fail them? Well, you have to pass them because it says you have to do them. You can have a more in-depth conversation and there's room to do things that apply specifically to your medical device. So this is a very good thing for industry. The FDA also in their guidance document added a full section uh, on risk management. This is very, very nice for a company because it lets you know 
Where can I use clinical history information? Where can I apply my chemical characterization testing to support my biocompatibility? It has those conversations so that you can know how to maximize the testing you're doing to support your biocompatibility. So before I leave the discussion about risk, I always like to make sure we're thinking, I leave you with a very good definition so we think about this appropriately. And this definition comes from ISO 14971, which is a guidance document on doing risk management for medical devices. It's, it's a very broad one, a broad document, but we can apply the definition here for biocompatibility. So when we think about risk, the definition should be a combination of the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of the harm, of that harm. So when we try to make this more readable or translate this into use, we say how likely is the harm to occur and how severe is it when it happens. Uh, so we want to take that into account. If we have a product that will save a patient's life and is applied for five minutes but might cause irritation, is that an appropriate risk? Yes, and you can have that discussion within that context of definition because irritation responses, once you remove the product, the response goes away, patient is alive. I think I would handle a rash just so I could be alive tomorrow, right? I mean, you know, we think about these risks. So this is the new table in 10993 part one. And I wanted to highlight some of the differences here between this version and the previous version that's driving this conversation about risk. So the very first column here is physical and or chemical information. So this is what's driving this full discussion up front. And we're gonna, I'm going to repeat this over and over again how we're gathering this data. So it's important that we understand from a manufacturer perspective and then from a regulatory perspective, how this device is made. What are the materials? How is it being manufactured, including sterilization and distribution? You know, that, that information, whether it's sterilized terminally by the manufacturer or at the site of use. So important information to understand what needs to be done to assess the biological safety. Uh, I've added in sensitization here. We always miss something in the committee, and this time we missed this title. So this column is referencing sensitization. So if you've printed it and you were guessing, you guessed right that that should be sensitization. Another one is they added a column here for material-mediated pyrogen testing. This is not a new test. This was just tucked under acute systemic toxicity. So it's been part of the standards for many years under 10993 part 11. It's in an annex where this is discussed. Um, but the recommendation from the industry in our ISO meetings was we need to separate this out so that people understand this is a separate test. And um, addressing pyrogenicity, even though it's a systemic response, it's a different set of tests that need to be considered. And then here, um, subacute and subchronic testing were often, or uh, these biological endpoints in the table were combined uh, as one line item. And so ISO has decided to separate those out into two categories. Um, and we'll see that there's some differences between ISO and FDA on how they're interpreting this. A and there's also some difficulties when we think about the testing that has to occur from a laboratory perspective. It's a little bit harder to meet uh, the expectations of the standards with just subacute or subchronic. Um, so this is a conversation that would could be had on detail, but when you're considering these endpoints, if you say, oh, in ISO we only have to do subacute, have a conversation with your laboratory to make sure that they can use the proper solvents to meet the testing criteria. So all these things that come into a larger conversation, it seems very simple, but there's some details and specifics that have to be addressed. And we'll talk about where to have that conversation as well. Chronic toxicity here as well identified in the table. And then you'll see, um, I, my circle is a little too far. I have carcinogenicity circled, but it should be just reproductive toxicity and degradation. So these columns are new, and you'll notice that there's never any you know, uh, E there to identify that it needs to be evaluated. So why would they put the columns there in the first place? It's so that we think outside the box about the risk of the device. 
So as a manufacturer, you know your device the best and you understand how it's contacting the patient population the best. So you need to identify and know and understand if this is a risk for your patient population. If you have a device that's intended to degrade or not intended to degrade but does, uh, there's some additional risks there that need to be mitigated. And if you have a device that is used on neonates or on a maternal population, we need to consider developmental toxicity and reproductive toxicity as well. So just more, more conversation to be had rather than, oh, what does the chart say? Tick, 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 we'll do our tests, submit our reports, because that, that approach is not working. Um, what we're seeing from our clients is that's not working. So I wanted to point out what's in the fine print. You see there's a very long conversation in the fine print at the end of this chart. I want to point out what the X and the E mean on the table. So if you see an X, it means it is pre, it's a requirement. This is how we start our risk assessment. So X means a prerequisite information needed for your risk assessment. So this means you need to consider your physical and our chemical information before you decide which testing needs to be performed. The E means you need to evaluate the endpoint that they're identifying as a risk. So the list also is not conclusive. Uh, you know, we need to think about how our device contacts patients and understand all of the risks. But we need to understand when the testing will be appropriate for the device. So here, if an implantation endpoint is required and you have a gel product, we're not going to be able to do an implant study appropriately as laid out in the 10993 standards for a gel product. So we need to have a conversation about how we can mitigate the risk of permanent contact with a gel, but also how, we're not, how it won't be mitigated through implantation. So justification of not performing a test. That's how we're addressing this endpoint. Yes, we're aware it could possibly be a risk, but this is how we're addressing this as a company. This is the FDA table, and I wanted to point out the differences here. You'll notice uh, they also have a material mediated pyrogen column that was newly added to the FDA's guidance document as well. So we like to see that that's added some good consistency there. But you'll see the FDA has still continued to keep subacronic and subacute in the same column. Um, and so the expectation for the FDA is that you will be addressing both endpoints. So if the ISO says only subacute and FDA says subacute and subchronic, you'll want to test to the higher expectation, so subacute, subchronic testing. Uh, questions also to be had with your testing laboratory, full discussion to make sure you understand how the test is performed and that you can meet both endpoints. One thing you'll notice is FDA does not have material evaluation in a column here, but in the document they do specifically say you need to consider your materials and your processing, have those identified. And as a company, we encourage really well-documented change control so that you know when materials and processes are changed and you have a step to assess whether that change is going to impact your biocompatibility. Because if you've tested on a product that you manufactured 10 years ago and you've changed your suppliers and maybe even changed your base material, are you putting out the same product and have you mitigated those risks again? Questions to think about. So this is the second half of the FDA table, and you can also see they have several notes and additional conversation, and there are X's and O's here. So for the FDA, recommended endpoints for consideration are the X. So this is what matches with ISO 10993-1-2009 version, so the previous version. Uh, and then the O's are the additional FDA recommended endpoints. I, I would like to stress the word consideration. FDA is still not asking for you to run out and do the testing. They want you to think about it and decide if that's an appropriate action for the risk of the device based on how it's manufactured and how it contacts the patient. So when you read 10993 part one, when I read it, I see that this when we address biocompatibility, it's a, a three-phase approach. The first one is we do our initial risk assessment. At Nelson Laboratories, we call that a biological evaluation plan, so a BEP. 
The second phase is we carry out the testing and risk assessments outlined in the BEP. And the third phase is to summarize what happened in phase two. And it may seem like redundant to do this third phase, but in 10993-1 uh, clause seven, they specifically require a biological evaluation report. It says that the results shall be evaluated by um, a person with appropriate education and experience to draw a conclusion about the device who will take into account all of the information, all of the test results, and conclude that the device can be considered biocompatible. And this becomes a very critical phase that we've understood from our perspective. The more um, test reports I review, I understand that maybe at the facilities who receive the test report, they didn't understand how to read it and the pertinent information that was within the test report because there were critical things that they have missed. And I've had to go back to the clients and say, this test does need to be repeated because it's going to miss these areas of risk for your device. And so it's important that as a company, you're having those documents verified and double checked so that um, you don't find yourself in an audit being told you have to go back and retest. It's nice to know ahead of time. So I wanna focus a little bit on the biological evaluation plan, just the initial upfront component um, and some of the basic information that we have noticed has been an issue when documents have been submitted to agencies. These things seem very basic, but I think as a, as a manufacturer, when you know a lot about your device, you kind of come from that viewpoint that you, you you forget to step back and give a bigger picture view instead of being so detailed. So I always recommend to start with a very good description of the device and always, always include a picture of the device, um, a full picture of the device with the individual components identified and then to be very exact about the body contact, exactly how it touches the patient. Um, just to stress a point, I was talking to a company and we were trying to address a material change and I you know, read through their, um, I think it was a 40 page document about material changes. These were on very, very tiny components within a handle of a device, very far from the patient, but their actual device has circulating blood contact. So they were stating that that component had circulating blood contact when it was in a sealed area that no blood would flow to at all. So the amount of testing, once that was clarified, was much easier, much better to do, much more relevant to address you know, this risk. I could really isolate out um, exactly what would be appropriate. And that, that right there will help you have a better conversation with your regulatory agencies. So these are two definitions I've pulled from 10993 part one to help with the exact contact definition. A lot of times um, I think companies, there's a confusion about what indirect contact means. And so indirect here is defined very clearly as a pathway from one component directly into the body. So I think of an IV bag, that that holds a solution. That IV bag has indirect contact with the patient. But if we have a, um, maybe a keyboard in the OR where the nurse is taking notes on the operation and then goes back and works with the patient, that keyboard is not indirect contact. That is secondary contact. It is outside the scope of 10993 part one. We're not able to assess that risk appropriately with the tests we have in 10993 part one. So it's, it's not relevant. So it's important to remember what's indirect. And although they don't define secondary contact, they do say the device has to have direct or indirect contact. So direct contact is easier to identify. It's the indirect that's a little bit harder. And then also transitory contact. So very brief contact. Maybe it could touch the patient during surgery for just seconds. Do you need to assess that for biocompatibility? What's the risk to the patient? So, so we want to think about that so we're not unnecessarily testing components that will give us irrelevant data to the clinical setting. So this is a table, uh, a chart in 10993 part one. We don't need to read the specifics, but I wanted to bring this up so that when you go back to 10993 part one, this will be a familiar site to you. So this is the guiding uh, question 
flow of how we mitigate our risk. We look at our materials and we ask ourselves some questions about the materials. Do we already use this material in another device? Is it sterilized and manufactured the same way? Does it touch the patient in the same way? Will that biocompatibility testing support the use of that material? Do we need some chemical characterization testing to support the use of this material? So it guides you through a list of questions so you can know what you can use from the material information you may already have at your facility. And if you know you have it and it's not organized in a way that you can easily find it, then maybe you'll think about how to restructure your documentation at your facility so you can better use the animal testing or the, the biocompatibility testing, chemical testing, more to benefit the company as you move forward. So I want to talk about material characterization because I feel like this has been a very gray area um, as far as how to meet this requirement in 10993 Part 1. It is on this section in a biological evaluation plan that your testing, uh, we say pivots. So it, will, it decides what testing you're going to do, how much chemical characterization testing you need to do, and how much biocompatibility testing you need to do. So I like to start with just some basic information that you typically see from your um, suppliers, possibly, is that you'll get certificates that say this is a USP class 6 material or this is a 10993 compliant material. So I've added some extra information here to, to give you more tools and also help you ask some more questions if that's the type of identification you're seeing on your material sheets. So if the sheet, the material sheet says it's 10993 compliant, you need more information because there's several tests in 10993. Did they only do cytotoxicity? That's not going to help you very much. I mean, it's good to know you start with a good material. That's important. But uh, it's not going to go very far for your material characterization. So ask more questions. Understand which tests were performed and how the material was tested. Was it sterilized? Did it go through any processing? If you're using a material that's commonly used for extrusion, for tubing, did your manufacturer go ahead and extrude it in its uh, testing process as well, you know, to make sure they were incorporating that? Ask some more questions from your suppliers. If it's USP Class 6 certified, um, so USP I know is a United States uh, testing, but it, it's commonly used, so if you have a supplier from the US, I think this is a common claim um, to note that it only covers irritation, systemic toxicity, and a one-week implantation. So if you look at those tests and then you look at the, the table in 10993 Part 1, those tests do not meet any device categorization endpoint requirements. It, it won't cover a full area, but it can help you reduce your testing uh, and maybe talk about the risk of the device in that context. So good information to have, but I think it's also good to know what that information means for you for supporting biocompatibility. <clears throat> so if we're talking about material characterization and moving on to, do we need to do chemical characterization testing? So these are two different things. Material characterization is identifying your materials. Chemical characterization testing is saying we need more information on our materials because of how it contacts the body. So this uh, section, this quote here, is straight from 10993 Part 18. Of course, not the new 10993 Part 18, but our current one we're working on. But the intent will remain the same in the new one as well. That the extent of chemical characterization is based on the nature and duration of clinical exposure of the product. And um, I'm going to explain a little bit more why that's the case. But I wanted to give our recommendations here in general. So these are three areas that we generally will place how far do we go for material characterization and chemical characterization testing. So if the device is limited contact, so only touching maybe the skin or very, you know, 15 minute contact with the patient, you identify the materials and your processing, and then you use the biocompatibility testing to support patient safety. So you use those endpoints, whether you have testing performed previously, other data, we're just going to stick to the endpoints on the 10993 table. <laughs> if you have prolonged contact device, something that's used for over 24 hours, and it's a little bit more invasive in the body, perhaps still an internal exposure, 
we want to consider using chemical characterization. We want to consider what we already know about the materials, but we're, we're going to look at the biological endpoints required and see if chemical characterization can help us there, where we would reduce our amount of animal testing under that requirement, typically. For a permanent contact device, you need to do chemical characterization. Um, this is where we can address some longer endpoints. So I'm going to step into that discussion really quickly to help clarify that. So we go back to this table. We understand our device has permanent contact. When we do that, we see that there are several of these long-term tests that need to be addressed. But these tests, if we look, carcinogenicity testing costs over 1 million euro. It's very expensive, takes several years. For a medical device company, that's not practical. That's not the timeline that we function off of. So it, we need to think of shorter ways to address this. And how we use, do that is through chemical characterization testing. But one thing that's nice is one chemical characterization test can address all of these endpoints. So I want to take a minute and look at a prolonged contact device, which sits here in this category B. Let's come down here. You can see that there's a few of these longer term tests that would need to be addressed. Sometimes that's where we have to make a call. Is it, is it more feasible to do the chemical characterization? That would give you great information, helps you address changes down the road. That's a really good option to look at. And then you think, OK, maybe we want to do the in vivo test that we've always done. That's our company history. This is what our database is based off of. So you need to look and make that decision. And of course, you can call us, uh, and we can help you make that judgment call. But that's where Prolonged sits kind of in a gray area of where we can use the chemical characterization to support biocompatibility. It's always great information to have, but data is even better if you can apply it to more than one thing. And that's what we're trying to do here. So for chemical characterization, it's really two phases. So 10993 Part 18, which you'll hear a lot of conversation today about because that is what Nelson Labs Europe, that's our area of expertise. It's for the chemical characterization testing. That actually occurs under 10993 Part 18. However, that data then has to be analyzed through a toxicological risk assessment because we need to take the chemistry that was detected on the device and correlate that now to patient use and patient exposure. And that happens through a lot of research done by toxicologists and some calculations. That's all kept under 10993 Part 17. So when, when we talk to you about chemical characterization testing, we're always assuming that there's a knowledge that we're doing the testing and a toxicological risk assessment. It cannot just be one. There needs to be two, two things. <clears throat> So I shortened this up because I think it's a very long name to say this is where you do a toxicological risk assessment for ENL, to clarify that. So I just broke this up quickly to understand the toxicological risk assessment. So it's a three step. I like threes if you can't tell. I want to put everything in three things. It's easier to remember. So the first stage is we do the chemistry. We determine the, the chemistry results, and we put that into a unit we can research, which is milligrams per device. That's a unit of compounds we can then research in public, publicly available um, data, where we look for appropriate toxic levels that we can accept on these compounds. So that's done here by looking for no Ls or low Ls, so no observed adverse effect levels. Once that research is done, the toxicologist selects an appropriate value based on that research, applies it to the medical device, and runs a few calculations. Tolerable intake, tolerable exposure, and a margin of safety. What it boils down to at the very end is this margin of safety, MOS. If we sit at a ratio of detected compound to amount uh, allowed as far as safety, so amount on the device to the safest amount, we want to sit at a ratio above one for each patient population. So if you have a special patient population like neonates or maybe prenatal neonates, uh, infants, we want to make sure that we understand the weight limit because that is very critical. 
So things to consider when we have these special devices. Another special patient population, always thinking outside the box from a, a general perspective, but for a medical device manufacturer, always understanding some more specific risks. So I kind of jumped right from one to the next. So that's kind of the end of the discussion about material characterization. Just a little more information to give you the tools to know, so you know what to ask for in the direction that the company should go in. The next step is to think about how we're testing, what we're actually testing for biocompatibility. If we do all of our testing on our raw materials, how are we assessing our processes and our sterilization to our final device? So there needs to be some conversation. So not everything about a full finished device can be supported with the raw material without a full understanding of the processes. Is it cleaned? Is it sterilized? Do you have mold release agents? Those types of information, we want to make sure we're addressing all of those steps as well on our finished device. It is a requirement of 10993 part um, 12, part 1 and also in part 12 where we talk about sample preparation has to be on a final finished device. Another thing that can be discussed in a biological evaluation plan, so we're still in the upfront initial risk assessment but we're getting a lot of really good information that's going to help us make some good decisions. Uh, we want to talk about a representative product. Are we using a family? Do we, do we have maybe products of different sizes? Uh, but we want to pick one size, so we're not testing each individual size. That seems redundant, right? Um, coupons, do we have a product that's very um, maybe expensive or difficult to test, and can we manufacture coupons out of the materials and simulate the finish and the processes? And then, of course, uh, making a monster product or, or a master product. Can we put a couple of products together and use that to test to represent all of our sizes or offerings? Um, and then do we, we need to discuss exclusion of components in testing. Maybe we have a few parts of our product that actually touch the patient and some that don't. So we want to make sure we're identifying upfront, these are not going to be considered and here is why. Um, and also electronic components do not work for any testing. <laughs> not, not for chemical characterization, not for biocompatibility. If you have an electronic component, we want to test without that. And that may mean some special manufacturing considerations when you make your samples for, um, in your manufacturing facility for testing. <coughs> Another thing we want to decide right up front is our extraction conditions, so time and temperature. And I think maybe some of you are thinking, why do we have to decide this? The laboratory should be deciding this. Um, we can guide you and make recommendations, but as the manufacturer, you are responsible to know why you are doing the testing under the conditions you're choosing, just like you need to know why you're doing all of the tests. So this is another step that needs to be understood. So these parameters are selected. This first one is only for cytotoxicity, 37 degrees for 24 hours. You might be able to get there for some of your products, but you'll have to support that. You, you really can't start here with most tests. You have to do only cyto with this. If you have a permanent implant, you have to do 72 hours extract for the US FDA. That's not an ISO, but the US FDA, and they, they mention it very casually in their guidance document, but then they did a webinar and we asked in the webinar, please clarify your requirement for this, and that is a requirement. If you have a permanent implant, your cytotoxicity test needs to be done at 72 hours extraction. 37 degrees for 72 hours. All other biocompatibility testing is done at 50 degrees for 72 hours. Anything outside of that norm will need special justification, specifically for the FDA. And then we have our test sample, our test selection. So here's where we go to the table. We say, okay, what have we mitigated with our material characterization? Did we use chemical characterization testing? Okay, so then we don't have to list some of these long-term points here. We're not going to do those tests. We're addressing those with chemistry. We'll identify our biocompatibility. One thing I like to just make people aware, even though there's one title here, like cytotoxicity or intracutaneous reactivity, it should say, yeah, irritation. 
Uh, there's several different test methods allowed in each standard, and those test, me test methods relate to how your device contacts the patient. And so you need to make sure you're not only saying, oh, we need to do cytotoxicity, that it's documented exactly which cytotoxicity test you're doing. Are you doing an MEM elution, an MTT quantitative method? Do you need to do the J Japan colony forming method because you're submitting to Japan? There are very specific test requirements in every single category here. So there needs to be careful selection by your company to make sure it relates to your product in the end and will mitigate the safety or the risk. <coughs> so when we talk about MDR specifics, so everything we've talked about up to this point will still address the new MDR requirements. They're asking for us to follow 10993 part one, we're doing that. There's an additional requirement that is only in the MDR and not in any of the ISO requirements, and that's for CMRs, carcinogens, mutagens, and reproductive toxic substances. There's a requirement to not have any more than 0.1% weight by weight of a CMR in your product. There's no guidance on how to determine this, though. And that's where we come into some difficulty and where we are giving our best interpretation of how we can meet this compliance for our clients. So we have three options. You can do an analysis, an estimation of the potential, analysis of possible alternatives, or argument for current design. So you can say, okay, let's figure out how much is in the device. You can ask your supplier if they have some already in, if they've made this claim already. Maybe your material suppliers say, well, we have, we've done chemistry, and this is how much of any of the CMRs we have present on our device. Um, if they don't have that, then you will need to do some chemistry to figure out how much of the CMRs you have in your device as well. Um, if you end up having some present, you can have a conversation about benefit to risk. Our product is a life-saving, product, it's used very quickly, we don't think that enough of this will transfer to the patient that's going to cause a risk or cause an effect. So this is, uh, like I said, a little bit of a gray area because no guidance has been given in the MDR on how to meet this requirement. But this is our offering at Nelson that we want to sit with you and help have this conversation in your risk assessments and work through the conversations with your suppliers and your notified bodies as well. So I wanted to come back to this picture because we've talked a lot about what could be included in your BEP. So a lot of conversation here, more than just we're doing these tests. You can see that there needs to be more information there. I'm not going to spend any time talking about specific tests in section two because I wanted to focus a little bit on the summary report. And this is something I've seen especially from notified bodies in Europe as feedback uh, from our clients that they're just handing over test reports and they need more conclusions drawn on those test reports. So a biological evaluation report as required by 10993 part one um, meets that requirement for these notified bodies. So what can we keep, what can we address in a biological evaluation report? Especially if we've done a risk assessment up front, we said we're gonna do this testing, why do we need to summarize again what we already did. You know, we say what we're going to do, we do what we say we're going to do, now we're gonna tell you that we did what we said we're going to do. So a lot of, you know, follow through. However, there's always some changes that occur, and I think you may all know this, right? You have this device and the engineers say, this is our final device. And you say, okay, final device, final device, and you test it, and three months later, oh, but we changed a few things. Always, right? We can address that in a biological evaluation report. So we can look at the risks of what changed, how it contacts the body, right? Because the engineers may say, oh, this completely changes the device, but it's way up here, not touching the patient. So we want to have that conversation about the changes. So we can do that in a biological evaluation report. Then we'll review the test performed, highlighting the important things about test performance like extraction conditions, exactly what was tested, exactly what test was performed and carried out, and a thorough review of the final report to understand if there are anything, any things in there that need to be addressed that would be caught in a regulatory review. 
And then we can address any test failures, so especially cytotoxicity, which is a common test to fail. It's a very sensitive test, and we incorporate things in medical devices that are cytotoxic. We use silver, we use zinc, we use copper, latex. Those things will not pass the cytotoxicity, but you still have to do it and say that you failed and then have a conversation about that. And that can happen in the summary report. So all the, I love that you guys are all laughing, so you know, yes. I, I deal with several cytotoxicity failures every single week to help clients have that conversation. So you're not alone. Um, you know, that's an important thing to just have a conversation about, especially when it's expected. So this is where having this risk-based approach is really nice, because you can have this conversation with your regulatory agency and your notified bodies. So this is just an outline of how our biological evaluation reports flow. Um, you can see it flows from telling the story. We give a little background on the device, so you can say if it's been on the market somewhere, if you've manufactured it for years, you're making a second generation maybe. Um, device description, categorization. We're going to have right up front our material characterization conversation because that's going to support the testing we did. So we have that conversation, and then we do biocompatibility tests performed and end the document. So I just want to leave you with a summary of the highlights of the presentation. So first, you're going to do a BEP, do an initial risk assessment. Second, have a very well-documented approach to material characterization that supports your plan. And then third, complete a summary report. Um, we also have these at the back which highlight our approach and biocompatibility will be handing these out as well and this is a slide rule to help you have a conversation about your device categorization and the expected endpoints to address. So please make sure you go home with one of these today and if you need extra for the rest of your team you can talk to our sales team here in Europe and they'll be happy to um, get those to you. Thank you.